Chapter 17 Once I got the white face on, it was smooth sailing. Then I did the outlining and the powdering, a little more coloring, and one eye was done. Next I worked on the nose. It was getting weirder and weirder. I got the black down and added the metallic silver and finally got to the whiskers. Then I finished with the ruby, red lipstick, added some green over my eyes, and sat back and looked into the mirror. Holy shit, I haven't seen you in 17 years, man, I said. Then I put on the boots, stood up, and I was almost 7 feet tall. I put my bandoliers on and my belt with the bullets and my leather gloves, and I looked into the mirror. Again. My face looked like porcelain, there wasn't a line on it. It was like I had gone through a time warp and I was 20, 6 years old again. An unbelievable feeling of power surged over me and I knew, deep down, that everything was going to be alright, I wasn't going to die an old, broke, forgotten man with nothing to show for all my work. I looked around the room in Jean's house and I saw Jean I mean, the demon again, darting his tongue in and out of his mouth. A stood up and he had the same weird walk. It was creepy. It was as if nothing had changed in 17 years. And now that we had donned our costumes and our makeup, we could announce to the world that Kiss was back for an epic reunion. It hadn't gone smoothly, though. Months earlier, George Swit brought us to a meeting in the offices of Kiss's new lawyer, Bill Randolph. One look at that guy and I hated him. He was the most pompous, arrogant piece of shit I'd ever met, one. Of those guys who wears a three, thousand, dollar suit and thinks he's God. Yet whenever Gene or Paul ordered him to do something, he got it done like he was a robot. I guess he had to, they were his only client. Gene and Paul were in L. A. So the office rigged up a huge video screen and conferenced them in. Gene and Paul went into their rap about how they had kept the brand going for years and that Ace and I were coming back again basically as employees. It was like they had practiced their lines for years they had it down. We're going to get this, you're going to get that. I'm listening and it boiled down to Gene and Paul dividing 70% of the proceeds while Ace would get 20% and I would get 10%. One of their justifications was that Ace had been named Guitarist of the Year in Guitar Magazine. I'm thinking, so what? He didn't write an award, winning song like Beth. You're all out of your fucking minds, I'm not. Doing this, I finally said. Over my dead body is Ace getting more money than me. There would be no kiss without us. I was the third member of the band. You forget that? You're telling me you're going to give this fucking guy more money than me. Ace and I started bickering, and Randolph tried to calm us down. You give me and Ace an even split and I'm aboard. I said. Well, this is what we talked about with George, they said. For the first time, I realized that Swit was ready to throw me under the bus in a second. Tall man had warned me that he was a piece of shit. How right he was. I'm out of here, I said, and started packing my stuff up. Randolph was in shock. You're going to walk away from a million dollars, he asked incredulously. A million? It better be a fucking hell of a lot. More than a million dollars we're talking about, because a million is shit. I can only imagine what your clients are going to make. Let's stop this, Ace interjected. Can I talk to Peter in private? Ace, George, and I went into a private room. We have to make this work, Ace said. We can make the same money. So we whittled down George's commission and agreed to make the same percentage. We should have dumped George and taken all the money for ourselves, but we were stupid. We thought we needed him. We went back into the meeting and announced our decision and everyone was happy. Then George mentioned that Ace had a record deal that was worth a hundred grand, so he wanted that amount from them because he wouldn't be able to do his album. So right away, he was making more money than me anyway. 
there was no record deal. It was all bullshit. Jean told us the next step was to come out to L.A. and talk about rehearsals. Then they disappeared from the screen. I left without even shaking Randolph's hand. We met again a few months later at Jean's house in L.A. Jean and Paul wanted to introduce us to Doc McGee, Kiss's new manager. They made it clear that Doc was managing Jean and Paul, but he would also be doing things that would benefit Ace and me, and we could always go to him if we had any problems. With that, Doc made his grand entrance into the room. It was like watching Michael Jackson walk in he was that much of a showman. Doc was a small man, maybe five foot six, but he was built like an ox. You didn't want to fuck with him. He had been a wrestler in school and he could throw you through the fucking wall. He was a nice, looking man and he dressed impeccably and wore a twenty, five, thousand, dollar watch. He looked the part. He had the stories, the dance, the pizzazz. He had made John Bon Jovi huge. He created Motley Crue and put the Scorpions on the map. Now he had a dream for us. Next thing we knew, Ace and I were falling in love with this guy, he was such a great con artist. Of course, he neglected to mention that all those other groups had fired his ass. We're going to make a lot more money than you think, Doc said. I have great ideas. When Jean and Paul came to me with this, I told them I would not touch you guys unless Peter and Ace were on board and you all put the makeup back on. That is the only way we're going to make millions of dollars. We're going to make enough so we can all retire. That was nice to hear. Jean took the floor again and pulled out a list of conditions, if they weren't met, he could pull the plug on the tour at any time. All band members had to be on time, we had to do interviews, we had to work out to get back in shape. There were to be no drugs, no heavy boozing. I was willing to do all of this anyway. Anyway, without Hitler's prodding. By January of 1996, rumors of our reunion began to surface. Jean was doing a radio interview in Chicago when the announcer asked him if a KISS reunion was possible. Fairy tales can come true, it can happen to you, Jean coyly sang. We made our first public appearance in makeup at the Grammy Awards on February 28. We were backstage in full makeup and costume, and most of the stars thought that we were a KISS cover band about to perform. In actuality we were going to present a Grammy with Tupac Shakur, the rap artist. Right before we went on, we convened in a little room and Jean and Paul started lecturing me condescendingly on how to speak to Tupac. Peter, you know that Tupac Shakur is a real gangster. He's been shot a number of times and he's the real deal, so don't rub him the wrong way, don't call him names. Of course, there was no drama. Tupac was wearing an expensive Versace suit and was a perfect Perfect gentlemen. Let's shock the people, he said, and we ambled out onto the stage. The audience went berserk and gave us a standing ovation, led by Eddie Vedder. Backstage afterward, all the stars had finally realized that we were the real kiss, and they all applauded us. We were on our way. Now the hard work began. We each got a personal trainer. Mine was named Gregory and he was a weirdo. He had been Paul's trainer and he belonged to the Hare Krishna cult so he had a shaved head. He took me to his temple one night and we did some chanting together. Gregory just kicked my ass. He had me drinking power drinks, distilled water, cleaning out my whole system. I'd meet him at Gold's Gym in Venice at 9 in the morning and we'd train for 2 hours straight. We did the treadmill for a half hour and then stretched and lifted weights. He taught me yoga positions. He was literally chiseling my body. I lost more than 25 pounds. I was in the best shape of my life. After the gym session, I'd drive to my drum tutor and drum for an hour. I had to relearn all the old KISS songs. 
it was humiliating to go meet some punk drummer and copy him playing my old shit because I had forgotten how to do it. At night I would watch VHS after VHS of KISS concerts. My tech and I would study them like football coaches. I had to relearn my body movements, the way I moved my head, the way I spun my sticks. I hated myself because some of that early drumming was pretty intricate. After working with the drum tutor, I'd spend an hour or two playing with Tommy Thayer, just guitar, and drums. He was Gene and Paul's butt boy for everything, but he was a KISS historian who knew the most minute details of every show we ever did. We'd play Deuce and Strutter and Detroit Rock City, and it wasn't easy to relearn all these songs I hadn't played for almost 20 years. Then I'd go downtown and rehearse with the band. They rented some cheap crammed little studio. That's the way they wanted it, so no one could fuck up and make a mistake and get away with it. Gene and Paul were right on top of my drums, so I was lucky to be able to breathe. We worked like dogs in that place. But I didn't mind working hard. I was 50 years old, older than the other guys, but I just thought of it as training for Tyson. You better be in great shape to get in the ring with him. Gene and Paul were workaholics to begin with, so they worked their asses off. But Ace was Ace, he was always lazy. He didn't take too kindly to all this regimentation. When we thought we had gotten better, we went into a larger rehearsal space, sir. We set up on a stage with a sound system and we'd mic my drums. Gene and Paul would get there early, just to try to catch us if we were late. I was always on time but Ace never was, and Gene would sit there. And look at his watch. I'd get upset with Ace, too, because I was ready to go. So Gene sent a fax to the effect of if you don't get your shit together, I'm going to pull the plug. It infuriated me. I hadn't missed one second of rehearsal but already he was asserting his power. Gene loved that fax machine. Sometimes he'd send a fax of three words. I went over to his house one time and he had ten broken fax machines lying around. He had worn them all out. By April we were rehearsing in New York at Sir. And because New York is the media capital of the world, we were forced to go to great lengths not to be seen together. Despite the Grammy appearance, there had been no announcement of a tour yet. That happened on April 16th at a monumental press conference on the USS Intrepid, a museum docked on the Hudson River. We got dressed up at our hotel and then drove over to the ship in a van. Every now and then we'd stop at a light and people would see us, go crazy, and charge the van. When we got to the ship, there were hundreds and hundreds of press people there. Doc had the room completely darkened, and then a huge kiss sign lit up and we each walked out with a spotlight on us. It was like the scene from Close Encounters when the aliens walk into the light. The cameras clicked away like crazy. After we posed, we sat down at a table and the questions came from reporters from all over the world. I was so proud to be part of something that was the biggest story on the planet at the time. The tour dates were announced and tickets went on sale shortly after that. I was back in El Dote. Asleep at 6 in the morning one day, when the phone rang. Groggy, I picked it up. Peter, are you sitting, standing, or lying down? Gene said in his monotone. I'm fucking sleeping, I said. The sun is just coming up. We just sold out Tiger Stadium in 47 minutes. 40,000 seats. No enthusiasm. No excitement, no emotion. He was just Joe the robot. But I jumped out of bed, screaming. And that was the way it went for venue after venue. Two straight years of touring, all around the world, sold out. Once the tour had been announced, I got paranoid that the IRS was going to garnish my wages. By then my tax bill had mounted to $3 million and I had finally hired Carol White, a tax specialist, to help me. She had me file for bankruptcy, which Ace also did. 
that was a heavy day for me. Going from millions and millions to filing chapter 13. By then both Jean and Paul had paid a million each to the IRS. Jean told me that he was sick and throwing up every day for a year after he signed over that million, dollar check to them. Carol worked it out so that after a certain number of days of my bankruptcy filing, my IRS debt would get wiped out and everything I made after that was mine. My biggest fear was the IRS would get wind of the KISS tour and that I'd be working for them. Those days went by so slow. Every day I dreaded getting that letter in the mail from the IRS. But despite all the publicity, even being on the cover of Forbes magazine with an article about how much money this tour would gross, somehow they never came after me. I sweated out the days, and my IRS debt went away. After a warm, up gig in California, the tour started at Tiger Stadium in Detroit on June 28, 1996. We were all nervous wrecks that day, but we were flying on adrenaline. Everybody got up early and we were in and out of each other's rooms at the hotel. At one point, some groupies had come to my room while I was getting my hair colored. I wound up making out with one of them, but they were kind of funky, so I settled for watching the two of them get it on. Then I got the call to come down, so I threw them out. And I had a panic attack. I momentarily forgot all the songs, all the arrangements, I didn't even remember the opening song. Everything went blank. But once we got in the car with Doc to go to the stadium, I calmed down. Doc told a million jokes and then regaled us with all these funny backstage rock and roll stories. Jean and Paul were calm and Ace was quiet. I was my usual physical self, talkative, very up. I still had that crazy energy. When we got to the gig, Jean and I shared one room and Paul and Ace had the other. Wow, we're gonna play for 40,000 people, I said in awe. That's freaking me out. I knew this would happen, Jean said coolly. He wouldn't even admit that he was excited. After we all went into the makeup room and put on our faces, we got dressed and they brought us up to the stage in golf carts, two to a cart. My heart started exploding in my chest. I was sitting next to Jean and I started beating out a fill on my leg and then I started playing his leg, just like I used to do for our big shows 20 years earlier. I finally broke him. He started laughing. You Italians, nothing changes, huh, he said. Man, this is going to be good, I said. Let's just stick to what we rehearsed. Don't change anything, Jean said. I agreed. Jean had spent a lot of time helping me with my drum solo. At first I just couldn't get it again, and he stayed late after rehearsals and helped me with it and then it was like riding a bike. I could close my eyes and it would be the same solo I did in 1975. The cart came up the ramp and the roar got louder and louder and suddenly we were in the stadium and the huge lights illuminated the field and the stands. It was an incredible feeling, like going to a giant church. They stopped us at the ramp to the stage, and we walked up the steps to our positions. There was a huge black curtain obscuring the stage, but the fans on the sides could see us and they went crazy and then everybody started roaring. By now the house lights had been dimmed and it was pitch, black in the stadium. All you could hear was the enormous hum from the amplifiers, and then purple searchlights started cascading around the stadium. We looked at each other and gave each other the thumbs, up sign. You wanted the best, you got the best. The old familiar intro was back, and then, with the curtain still lowered, we went into the first few bars of Deuce. Then there was a loud explosion, the curtain dropped, and there we were. It was like going to heaven. I felt like I could do no wrong, we were such a well, oiled machine. We played for over two hours in the sweltering heat but I didn't feel a thing. This was why we had put in all those grueling hours of training. At that moment, every second of that agony was worth it. When it came time to do Beth, the next, 
to, last encore, I walked around from behind the drums and sat on that stool again and I started crying. We always had a special bond with the Detroit fans, they were the ones who embraced us first and put us on the map. I was overwhelmed by the love that was coming toward me, people calling my name and saying they loved me. I hadn't heard that for 17 years. How could I not cry? We had a spectacular show, combining elements of all our previous shows. Gene was spitting blood and spewing fire again. During God of Thunder, he would fly up into the air to a platform where he sang the song. Ace's guitar would shoot rockets that would hit the stage lights and cause them to explode or dangle from a wire. Of course my drum kit levitated high into the air. Doc felt that Paul needed a grand moment too, so later into the tour they devised a rig that enabled Paul to fly over the audience. One night it malfunctioned and people actually hung on Paul's leg as he cruised over the audience. He was really pissed off. But he loved flying. When we played venues where it was impossible to set it up, he'd get furious. One of the major changes on this tour was the addition of a huge, high, tech video screen. Everything you do will be visible to the audience, Doc lectured us. There isn't anything the fans will miss now. Remember to smile, Peter, Doc constantly reminded me. Wait a minute, Kiss never smiled. Now all of a sudden we're smiling? What's so funny now? We're smiling because we're going to the bank? I'd ask. The truth was that just a smile on that big screen would make the audience go bonkers. It was that powerful a tool. A few nights I'd be nursing some wounds from something Gene or Paul might have done and I'd have my head down and be cursing, and the camera would catch me mouthing the words with that nasty face. So I quickly learned to grin and bear it. But at first everything was wonderful. We were all getting along, and the good vibes were infectious. Paul brought a ghetto blaster into the makeup room and we chose our favorite music to play while we put on our faces. Sometimes we would play golden oldies like the Four Seasons, and Ace would go ballistic. He hated that music. He wanted to hear Hendrix. There were still women around but the chicken coop had been replaced by the hotel bar. We were staying at Four Seasons Hotels and they all had high, class bars, but on the nights we were there, the room was crawling with women, from teenagers to retirees, all wanting us. The guys invited me down a few times, but I was turned off by the scene. I'd be chatting up girls who were barely a few years older than my 16, year, old daughter, and I felt like a pervert. Plus the old grey mare wasn't what she used to be. Those young girls were probably used to guys. From the football team who would bang the shit out of them from sunup to sundown. Now, there had been a time when I could have killed them one by one. They could come and go and everybody would get their pants fucked off. But the spoiler wasn't the spoiler anymore. I could imagine what they'd say, what's the whole thing about the spoiler? Peter fucked me once and fell asleep, whoop, duh, do. I just didn't want to put myself in that kind of situation. Frankly, I didn't want women around at all at that point. Playing drums for Kiss was incredibly hard work. I wouldn't have been able to do it if I had been up all night boning a groupie. No band on the planet worked as hard as we did. Mick Jagger can wear some jeans and throw a scarf on, Tyler put some tight pants and a chick shirt on, but we had the boots and the heavy costumes. Even wearing that makeup for two hours was no picnic. When you started sweating, the sweat had to break through that powder, so you were sweating under the makeup. Then you took it all off and showered and had to get ready to do it all again the next night. So I put the girls on hold, for the most part. I was 50, not 20. 6. Forget about it. Gene was the only one of us who still had the roadies or the bodyguards out scouring the audience for chicks. Sometimes he'd fool around with them during the show. 
he had a little station that was curtained off to the side of the stage where he could grab a coffee or some water. I'd be in the middle of my drum solo and I'd look over and he'd have two girls at the station. One of them would be flashing me, and he'd bend the other one over and grope her. I couldn't believe it. He just couldn't get enough sex. Jean was in the dressing room one day getting dressed and he had a herpes outbreak so bad that it was all over his neck, his chest, down his stomach, down his legs. They had to bring a doctor in to give him an injection. I heard that Shannon got wind of it and Doc had to go out and get her a very expensive rock to calm her down. Jean was truly a pig when it came to sex. I remember one day early in our career when we were rehearsing and Jean and Paul had to share a microphone and Paul suddenly recoiled as if he had been shot. Holy shit, what the fuck did you eat? Paul said. You know what I ate, Jean said. Then he smiled and you could still see the menstrual blood on his teeth. I didn't brush my teeth this morning. I want to savor the taste of it all day, Jean said. Paul refused to continue the rehearsal until somebody found a breath mint. Sometimes on the reunion tour I'd be in my room at night and there'd be a knock at the door. I'd open the door and there would be a chick with fucking gazambas out to here standing there. Hi, Mr. Chris. What can I do for you? I'd say. Well, there's a lot of things you can do for me. Do me a favor. Go over to Jean's room, I'd say, and just then Jean would stick his head out into the hall. I just wanted to see if you would take the bait, he'd smile. It was a constant battle between good and evil with Jean. For the most part, Ace didn't partake of the groupies, because most of the time he brought a mistress on the road with him. All of them were drug addicts or drunks or perverts. All Ace would do was stay in his hotel room, take drugs, and have sex. He'd set up a bunch of computers and there'd be cords and hard drives and outlets all over the place. Ace was not allowed to have a key to the minibar, but he was usually able to sneak some alcohol in. One time Valerie, one of these girls, knocked on my door. What do you want, Valerie, I said with disgust. I just didn't like this chick. She was really crazy and the worst influence on Ace. Ace wants a bottle of wine. Actually, two would be good. He'll pay you for them, she said. No. Ace is cut off. He can't drink, I said. I was specifically told by Doc not to sell Ace any booze. I was breaking her balls. What, she said. Ace said I could depend on you, that you're cool. I am cool. But I can't sell you the alcohol. She was dumbfounded. But I could give it you. And I don't want to hear a word about this, I said, and handed her a bottle of red and a bottle of white. Her face lit up like a Christmas tree. Whenever Ace did get a new girl on the road, he'd go into his whole doctor routine with them. I'd be sitting in the dressing room after a show and I'd hear him talking to our wardrobe girl, whom I had nicknamed Baby Beth. Hey, Baby Beth, put some rubber gloves in my bag and make sure there's a big jar of K, Y. I knew right then it was going to be a sick night. You in tonight? I'd ask him. Oh, yeah, I got to operate on a few patients later. Rubber gloves tonight, baby. We're going in deep. One night I actually heard them from all the way down the hall. His current girlfriend loved anal sex and I heard her screaming like a banshee, fuck me like a truck driver. Fuck me like a truck driver. As he banged her in the ass. I could only imagine what the businessman in the room below him was thinking. We were the hottest act in show business during the reunion tour and, of course, all that attention and adulation just magnified Jean's already godlike ego. The crew was so pissed at Jean that they made a loop of the scene in one of Jean's movies where Jean's character had a grenade shoved into his mouth and his head got blown off. When they wanted to have fun, they'd smoke a joint, pop open a beer, 
and watch Jean's head explode over and over and over again. Jean even tortured poor little baby Beth. She broke her hump for us night in and night out, but Jean just kept demanding shit from her and heaping abuse on her when she wasn't waiting on him hand and foot. One night she went crying in Doc's arms and told him she wanted to quit. Doc consoled her and then went to see Jean. You fucking asshole, Doc reamed him. We got a long tour ahead of us and nobody can dress you guys like her. Nobody else would put up with your imbecilic shit and your filthy body. Now, I'm going to bring her in here, and you're going to apologize to her and give her a raise. So Beth came in and Jean said, come here, Beth. And he sat her down on his lap. You know I'm sorry, baby Beth. When I put that makeup on I'm just not myself something happens to me and I become that monster. She was getting a speech instead of an apology. But he gave her a raise and she stayed. In fact, she turned the tables on him. Doc had instituted a little pre-show ceremony that he had done with some of his other bands. We used to form a circle right before we went on and he'd give us a pep talk like a football coach. All right, you fuckers, there's 17,000 people out there that paid their hard, earned cash to see you guys because they love you and you're the best band in the world. After a while we alternated. Me, Tim Rosner, our tour manager, or someone else would give the little speech, and we'd try to crack everybody up and lighten the mood. One night we asked baby Beth to do the speech and this little four, foot, nine firecracker got in the circle. All right, you four lame, old, fat, wig, wearing clowns. Get out there and earn your money. If you can make it up the stairs, she said. We cracked up so hard we could barely get on the stage. Berating the crew was one thing. But shortly after the tour was underway, Jean and Paul began to direct their wrath toward me and Ace. They had always wanted the power when we were coming up, but Aquoin had always been there to check their darkest impulses. I went into the reunion with a positive vibe. I wanted it to work, I wanted to make amends. But every step of the way, they would wield their power. Ace and I were instrumental in creating KISS, and now we were being treated like replaceable sidemen. And the same forces greed and power that years earlier had conspired to destroy the band were coming into play again, only now they were magnified because we were playing on such a greater stage. The way that Jean and Paul would address us was beyond belief. If anyone would ever talk to you with such condescension and contempt, you'd have every right to break their nose. I lost interest in fighting with them. I was like George Harrison in Let It Be, I'll play whatever you want. Paul was never happy. Was I playing too fast? Too slow? Not slow enough? You couldn't please him. Everything had to be perfect for him, yet here's a guy who was imperfect in his own head. He couldn't even be happy in his own skin, so he strikes out and hurts other people to get his rocks off. Now that the two of them controlled the band, they could have their way on everything. Ace and I had no votes anymore. Gene was the more vocal of the two with all his dictums. Forget about spontaneity and the joy of creation. We had become a big machine, lumbering our way from city to city. Gene's conception was that the band should be like the Japanese restaurant chain Benihana. You go to chef school at Benihana and you learn exactly how many peppers to put on the grill, how many shrimp, how much sauce. And it never varies from restaurant to restaurant. Great, now we're the greatest Japanese restaurant. Chain in the land. It was disheartening, but I could take the abuse when it hit me directly. When the abuse was being published in articles that my daughter could read, I drew the line. When Ace and I left the band originally, there was no mention at all in the press about drug problems or alcohol abuse. We were leaving because of creative differences, and we were all still one big happy family. But now Jean and Paul had control and they could redefine the terms. Now that we were back on top, 
the press was crazy to get any new angles on us, so they began asking why we had broken up in the first place. Gene had a mouth that matched the size of his fucking ego, so he was only happy to oblige them. We used to get a folder every morning with clips of all the news articles written about us. One morning I was thumbing through it and I started reading an interview Gene had done with some big, city newspaper. He was quoted talking about My extensive drug use and ACEs alcoholism and how they impaired our ability at the time. I went crazy. I thought, my daughter is going to read about all my past drug use. She doesn't know anything about this stuff. In fact, hardly anyone knew about it, but now it was in black and white in the Seattle paper and the Washington paper and the Detroit paper and the New York paper that I was a crazed drug addict in the 70s. But this was the 90s. I walked over to Gene and threw the clippings in his face. Now that he had started mouthing off to the press, all bets were off as far as I was concerned. You fucking piece of shit. Why are you saying shit like this? I yelled. We're back together and you have to tell people that I was a fucking insane gun, toting drug addict. You don't see me saying you were an egomaniacal herpes, ridden sex addict. Oh, they got it wrong, he hemmed and... Hawed. The writer changed my words around. It's not my fault. I have a family now. They don't need to know about that shit. Don't you ever open your big fucking mouth again. Who was fooling who with the drug, addict talk? By then Paul was carrying around a huge Louis Vuitton bag full of enough pills to choke a horse. Paul was a major hypochondriac so he had muscle relaxants, tranquilizers, pills to make you tan, pills to make you lose weight, pills to get you going. He once showed me his phone book and he had at least 50 doctor's names in there. Ace would look longingly at Paul's bag and say, if we could only rob that bag. The irony was that I was completely clean now. I was straight, and I enjoyed playing straight. It was such a gas being up on that stage again. We knew that every show was sold out and that the minute the curtain dropped, everyone loved us. Gene and Paul have largely written the history of Kiss, and in their version the rap on me is that I was a complainer. It was true, I was a complainer. But if you analyze what I was complaining about, you'd see that I had every right to bitch and more so. I hadn't taken hard drugs in 20 years, but when Ace continued his drug use, I would always be tarred with the same brush. I also routinely complained about my compensation the grossly unequal distribution of monies between Gene and Paul and Ace and myself. Besides the patently unfair terms that we agreed to before the tour started, there were all these other streams of income that those two guys were divvying up and not even telling us about. They'd have meetings with Doc and the accountant and never tell me. I'd walk into the lobby and Gene and Doc would be talking about something, and when I'd come up they'd change the subject abruptly. And when your bandmate berates you in front of your own child, how could you not complain? I took Jeanneli out on some of the dates on the reunion tour and during a sound check while Jeanneli was sitting by the stage, Paul turned around to me and said, what the fuck are you playing, or what's with your fucking timing? They knew how much I loved my daughter, all I talked about was my kid. For them to humiliate me in front of her was so sinister. They were masters at beating you down and pushing your buttons so that you'd ultimately feel like a loser. Between the two of them, Gene was much more in your face, but Paul was passive, aggressive. When Paul didn't get his way, he'd start getting flustered and pacing the room in circles and you could just feel the bad vibes. Gene would then do whatever it took to placate Paul. Gene might have been a control freak, but Paul usually got whatever he wanted. We couldn't stay at certain hotels because Paul thought they made their pancakes the wrong way. I'd get revised plans under my door all the time because Paul wanted to leave a city and fly to the next town for one petty reason or another. One night we actually left a hotel because it reminded Paul of a funeral parlor. And I was the crazy one. Paul is much more Machiavellian than Jean. 
Jean was crass and brutal, but he had a real naivete about him. But Paul could cut your throat and he'd be out of the room before you even realized you were bleeding. He probably picked up a lot of techniques going to see his shrink all those years. Jean and Paul really have nothing in common. Jean embarrasses Paul in public with his crude behavior. Paul likes to feel that he's cultured, he dabbles in painting. The only thing they can agree on is the importance of making money. Then they overlook each other's faults and connive together to optimize their earning power. It was primarily the money issues that divided us on that tour. Having George Swit represent Ace and me was a huge mistake in retrospect. George threw a lot of fuel on the fire but when it came to crunch time, he folded like a cheap accordion. The bickering started when Ace and I got our first paychecks on the tour. The amounts didn't seem right, so Ace and I grabbed George, threw him into the wall, and told him to get us more money. I didn't spend thousands of hours in a gym to get this jump change, I protested. We're on the cover of Forbes magazine, we must be earning some serious money. So George made up a whole list of our demands and vowed to talk to Jean and Paul. He said Ace and I would get everything we wanted. The day of the meeting came and George actually wore a suit and tie. It was the four of us and George in the room. George started telling them all of our demands. They listened for a little while, and then Jean and Paul just reamed George out. Who the fuck do you think you are, they berated him. You're not our manager, Doc McGee is. You're just a guest on this tour. They told him that he wasn't going to come on the tour anymore unless they approved it, and that they didn't give a shit what his concerns were. George started to melt. I'd never seen a man break down like that. Ace had to step in at one point. Can you stop this? Enough is enough, he said. They walked out of the room and George was devastated. His excuse was that he had taken a Valium before the meeting and it fogged his brain. Yeah, right. At one time this guy could do more blow than anybody in the room and he falls apart because he took one Valium. Ace's response to all this misery was to retreat into his own cocoon of drugs and booze. Ace had a very large ego, almost on PAR with jeans, so it must have been extremely painful for him to be treated like an employee by those two. But doing coke and designer drugs was not the solution. Even I was lecturing Ace and telling him to straighten up. I would tell him that he couldn't bullshit a bullshitter and I knew when he was fucked up. I'd remind him about his daughter and how'd she react to her father being blotto. But with a girl by his side to enable him, it was an uphill battle. The only time I got in trouble on that tour was when I had a little too much red wine. We were playing Madison Square Garden for three nights about a month into the tour and after the first show, I took my whole family to some nice Italian restaurant that Doc rented out for me. The bill came to five grand, but I didn't care. They were so happy to have us at that place that they kept plying me with red wine so by the time I got back to the hotel, I was loaded. Red wine always made me romantic, so I started missing Deb. I decided I wanted her there at this glorious moment. I was back on top of the world, we had sold out the garden for three straight nights. I was going to be rich again, a lot richer than her husband. And... That's all she ever wanted, right, the money. So I called her. It was about two in the morning in El Dote. And I woke her up. What are you doing? I said. I don't know, I was sleeping. Where's Jean Eiley? She's in her room, sleeping. Why don't you get her and get something on and I'll fly you to New York first, class and spend the week with me. I'll wine and dine you and I'll take you out and you can buy anything you want and we'll have a great time. I was drunk out of my mind. She was married to Mac by then, but I didn't care. Just like he didn't care when I was married to her. You're crazy. Yeah, but so are you. This is a tantalizing proposition, isn't it? Well, it's nice, 
but I'm married, Peter. I have a son now. Bring him, too. I've got a lot of money now. Deb. We could buy a mansion in Hollywood. I think you really have to sober up, Peter. I'm sure you'll feel different tomorrow. Jeanile and I can't hop on a plane and see you. All right, I said, and hung up. The next morning I woke up with a brutal hangover and I thought, what the fuck did you do, you idiot? You're gonna do the same thing you did before, you're that stupid? It was a reality check for me. I was so drunk and delusional that I thought I could do anything. Now that Deb was definitively out of the question, I went back to keeping my eyes open for girls. I actually had seen one girl backstage that first night before I went out to dinner with my family. I came out of my dressing room after the show and I met my best friend, Eddie, and his wife, Dottie. I was hugging them and I looked down the hallway in the garden and I saw this tall blonde with black nylons. She was so hot. Plus I was a sucker for long legs. She was walking with this guy with long hair and I could only see his back. I've got to have that, I said, and Eddie laughed. No. I'm serious. I want to see what she looks like from the front, I told him. So I hugged them good, bye and I caught up with this woman. The guy she was with was Robbie Afuzu, the drummer from Skid Row. He was a real sweetheart. Glad you came down, I told Robbie. I wouldn't miss it. You guys were so great, he said. Then Robbie introduced me to the girl whose name was Gigi. She had a flyer that she'd had signed by Jean and Paul and Ace, and now she asked me to sign it. I did it. Is this your girl, Robbie? I asked. They both answered no simultaneously. Oh, that's cool, I said. You're really beautiful. They were going to a Ford modeling agency party after the show. So I said good. By but I kept checking out Gigi as they walked away. On the third night of the shows, I looked out into the audience, and there was Gigi again. I pointed at her with my stick and winked at her. There was a party after the show at the Riga, where we were staying, and somehow I wound up in Jean's room, where he was entertaining a stewardess and a beautiful girl we had met in Tupelo. Jean wanted to get rid of the young blonde from Tupelo and be with the stewardess, so he suggested that I take her downstairs to the party. We went downstairs and I felt a little dirty that I was sitting with this corn, fed twenty, one, year, old. I looked over and sure enough, there was Gigi sitting at a table with a bunch of hot girls and rondels and her, the legendary promoter. Apparently one of Gigi's friends, who looked kind of trashy to me, wanted to fuck my brains out but didn't have the nerve to approach me, so she had Gigi escort her over. Now I was sitting at a table with three chicks. Gigi started talking to Tupelo because she wanted to create an opening for her friend. But the whole time that I was talking to her friend, I was staring at Gigi. Before I could make a move, Gigi and her friend got up and circulated. Now I was desperate to get in touch with Gigi, so I left Tupelo for a second and went over to Rondell's Enner and asked him to get Gigi's number for me. He said it was no problem and I went back to Tupelo. Then we went upstairs to my room and we were lying on the couch, watching TV, and I started playing with her titties. Then I threw her on the bed but I couldn't get it up. I couldn't handle being with such a young girl. I didn't want to let her down so I gave her probably the best head she'd ever received. She had a major orgasm and then she was waiting for me to fuck her and I went, I really don't feel well. I think you'd better leave. She looked at me like I was out of my mind, and I was. So she left and I went to bed. We had the next day off and I called Dell's Enner. And he came through with Gigi's number. So I had a couple of beers and called her at home. She was a little taken aback that I had gotten her number from Ron, but she warmed up a bit and we started yakking for hours. 
I asked her to come over to the hotel but she told me that she was getting honored with a chip that night for 12 years of sobriety. That was impressive to me. I told her to drop by afterward, and she did. When she got there, Doc was sitting with Jean at a table by the bar and he told Gigi that I was up in my room and that I was expecting her. Well, that didn't sit too well with Gigi, going up to a stranger's room in a hotel. So she asked Doc if it was safe to go up. Absolutely, Doc said. Of the four of them, Peter is the truest gentleman. He's the oldest and the nicest. He will never, ever step out of line with you. I would bet my career on it. A nice endorsement. She came to the door and I was happy to see her. I had ordered cream brulee earlier and I hadn't touched it, so we split it and then we talked. And talked. And talked. This girl could talk. She was obviously in tune with her emotions and she had hung out with older people so she seemed wise beyond her years. I was thinking that this was the greatest girl I'd ever met. Suddenly it was 4.30 in the morning. Why don't you spend the night? I suggested. I won't touch you if you don't want me to. No, I don't want you to and you're not going to touch me. I'm not that kind of girl. What do you think? You got gold between your legs. I joked. Well, yeah, and most men will dig for gold until they get it, Gigi said. But she agreed to spend the night. Meanwhile, I was thinking, yeah, right, you don't want me to touch you, but once your ass is in the bed, it's all over. I gave her a pair of my boxer shorts to wear and we both got into bed. I put my arm around her. Don't even think about it. I just told you, she protested. So we each slept on our side of the bed. I was intrigued because this was the first chick who had turned me down since I had become a musician. In the morning we ordered breakfast and Doc came to the door. He suggested that I take Gigi with us to Boston for the next gig. We were flying for the first time in our new jet. Doc cleared it with the other guys, and Gigi agreed to go. She was going in the limo to the private jet. She was going to see the full power of Kiss. She's going to drop dead and she's going to fuck me tonight in Boston. No way around that. We got to the airport and boarded the G-4 and I was floored. None of us had ever seen such luxury in all our lives. Beautiful leather seats a gorgeous bathroom, great food. It was obvious we were at a whole new level. We went in and everybody grabbed their spots. Doc and Paul sat toward the front of the main compartment. Gene went right to the rear because he hated flying. Ace, Gigi, and I sat in the seats next to the big table in the middle. Now, I know my boys, and they were all checking out Gigi. Then Jean started showing off and threw Gigi a prototype of the new KISS collectible baseball. What do you think of this baseball, Gigi, he asked her. She looked it over and saw that there were two pictures of Jean's face on it, one of Ace, and one of Paul. And none of mine. Well, it's a nice ball, but where's Peter, she asked, and threw it back to him. You didn't give him permission to use your copyrighted image, Peter, she asked me. Gene almost shit himself. Yoko Ono, he said with venom. We got to the hotel and we had a big meeting before the show. I was still hurt by what had happened the last night at the garden. It was a Saturday night and we were running late and the Teamsters were going to get some outrageous amount of money if we hit overtime, so when we came back after our first encore, Tim suggested we cut Beth. He didn't know that that was my big moment, especially in the garden, where I would hand my mother a rose after I sang the song. When we came off stage after rock and roll all night, I was in tears and explained to Tim how important Beth was for me to perform at the garden. He had unwittingly taken away my homage to the memory of my mother. I brought cutting Beth up again in the meeting and Jean and Paul just were ruthless, 
making fun of me and my concerns. I went back to the room where Gigi was and I was literally shaking and sweating. What's the matter? Gigi asked me. Could you just do me a favor and hold me? I asked her. She was probably thinking that I was. Just conning her to have sex, but we laid down together in the bed and she just held me. We just had a meeting and you don't know how horrible these guys are, I said. Nothing has changed. I thought these guys were different, but they haven't changed at all. We played that night at the Fleet Center and the show sucked. Ace played especially poorly because Joe Perry and his son were in the audience, and having Perry there would always make Ace choke. That night I tried messing around with Gigi again but she didn't go for it. I realized that this broad was serious. I flew her in on the private jet, had a nice steak dinner, she saw the band perform for free, and she still wasn't putting out. I started thinking that maybe this was just the right type of woman for me. She actually thought for herself, she didn't do drugs, and she was drop, dead gorgeous. Her ass could stop traffic. I wasn't an ass guy, but I became one. The next day Gigi flew back to New York and we went on to Canada. I began to live on the phone with her. I was falling in love and I couldn't wait to get back to my room after the show and call her up. And I hate the phone. We'd stay on the phone for two or three hours every night and I told her about my youth, my first wife, my second wife, all of my problems. About two months later we played Philadelphia and Gigi came down to see me. We came back to the room after the gig and I was in full makeup and I leaned over to give her a kiss and she got all freaked out. Maybe it was my lipstick. So after I took off my makeup and stage costume, we sat down on the bed and Gigi suggested that we play cards. I think she said that to divert a sexual encounter, because we still hadn't had sex. That night, I asked Gigi to go steady with me. Like you're my girl and I'm your guy and there's no women for me and no other men for you, I said. Yes, Peter, I know what going steady means. Gigi said. And then she said we should give it a try. From that moment on, we each gave 100% of ourselves into the relationship. Which meant that I was finally getting lucky that night. Sort of. The first time we had sex was not great. I felt pressure after all those months of a long, distance courtship and I had a problem getting stiff. The spoiler was more like a noodle. This was complicated by the fact that Gigi had insisted that I wear a condom. She started lecturing me about AIDS and genital herpes, and since I was a rock star I was a prime candidate for all of that. I hadn't put on a raincoat for what felt like centuries. So we argued about that for a while and I had to call and get one of the roadies to get one. Now that I had it, I had forgotten how to even put it on. Finally I got some sort of erection and it was getting bigger and I finally got the fucking thing on and it was half on and half off and I was losing it. Take your time, I understand, Gigi said. There's nothing to understand. It's the fucking Trojan. It's not used to being covered. Man, we're not kids. Finally she rolled over and I put it in from the back and came immediately. I thought, Jesus, mother of God, I waited all these months and it's over already. So I dozed off for a few minutes and then I woke up and I was feeling horny and thinking I can keep it up so I started poking her in the back to wake her and she said, you're not going to get it up again. How do you know? Because I know, and then you're going to get frustrated and you're going to get angry. Well, maybe you should suck it. You don't even know what to do, I said, and we started arguing and she got up crying and put her coat on and walked out. Now I was pissed off and she was crying in the hallway and I felt like shit. I called her. Back into the room. I'm sorry. I guess I'm just accustomed to sex, crazed women that do wild things to arouse me. I'm not used to sleeping with a lady and being gentle. You're like a butterfly, you're really tender, 
and I'm not used to that. You've got to give me a little time to adjust. We still had differences in what we enjoyed sexually. But I started weighing it out and I realized that in nine years I was going to hit 60 and it wouldn't be about sleeping with four women or running naked through a hotel lobby. It would be more about really caring for one partner. Gigi was the first woman I ever met that really loved God, like I do, so there was a spiritual connection there that I had never experienced. All I ever missed about Deb was fucking her. I never missed her company. No marriage will ever last on a foundation of sex alone. Eventually the raging fire will diminish into a pilot light. When Gigi and I first met, we were sitting there. And I said, out of the blue, the heart is a lonely hunter yeah, that hunts on a lonely hill, she said, finishing the poem. She told me that when she was a girl she had found that poem and she loved it so much that she kept it in her wallet. Fireworks went off in my brain. I knew that Gigi and I had to be destiny. We had a break in touring and I took Gigi to Hawaii and we had a great time. I learned more about romance on that trip. I learned how to be nicer in certain ways, nicer than my usual no, holds, barred attitude about sex. When I left her early that last morning to go to the airport on my way to Japan, it was really emotional. I love you. I really think I'm getting this love thing, I said. I'm still not happy about a lot of things, though. Yeah, I know what you're unhappy about, Gigi said. But I'm sorry. It's just not me. I'm not Deb. She was right. I had to get over the fact that every woman I got into bed with wasn't Deb or Sweet Connie from Little Rock. It was a hard lesson to learn because I had been around crazy women my whole life. It was nice to have a two-week break, because every place we went on the reunion tour was total pandemonium. We'd have press following us everywhere we went, motorcycle escorts to the arenas. I used to love going up to the motorcycle cops and hugging them and telling them how much I loved policemen. They got us to the venues in time. It was the same outside the country. There was always kiss mania in Japan, so that wasn't new. We played the Tokyo Dome and the show was a nightmare. The stadium was so big that they had ramps on either side of the stage that protruded so far sideways into the audience that if you went all the way out on them, you couldn't even see the other guys in the band. And if that was the case, who was going to cue the end of the song? Well. Paul took one look at those things and he immediately went ramp running. He was gone he wasn't even in the band anymore. Gene saw this and wasn't about to let Paul have all the fun, so he took off and he was the cue man. So I looked out and all I saw was Ace and a gazillion people. I was playing, and I was hearing Gene and Paul's chords, but they were sloppy because they were out touching girls and throwing kisses. So the whole show went down the shitter. Then Ace disappeared. He wasn't going to be left out. So I was all alone on the stage with all my guys running on the ramps. Then I got an idea. At the very end of each show, all four of us would come out to the front of the stage and count one, two, three, and we'd all bow in unison. It was bullshit that I wasn't getting noticed like the other three, so right before we lined up for the bows, I ran out on the ramp to the very end and gave a victory salute to the fans, and they went crazy. Then I came back, running right. By the guys who were waiting to do the bow, and did the same thing on the other side of the stage. When I ran back and got in line, Jean leaned over to me. Are you satisfied, he said. Very, I smiled. It was a wild trip for those two years we were out on the reunion tour. I was convinced that Doc was in collusion with Jean and Paul, ripping Ace and me off on all sorts of side deals. All I knew was that when the tour was over, Jean and Paul would be building mansions and Ace and I would wind up with a fraction of that kind of money. I wouldn't put it past Doc to get involved in shady dealings. He was arrested in 1988 for helping a drug, 
smuggling ring with connections to Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega import 45,000 pounds of grass from Colombia to North Carolina. He pled guilty to a conspiracy charge but never served time. Doc had hired this accountant named Paco, who had toured with the WHO and Led Zeppelin. Paco knew every trick in the book. One day Gigi accidentally walked into the count room, the place where the promoters settled up with the band. She saw two identical suitcases, one black and one brown, both packed to the brim with cash. They banned her from that area for the rest of the tour. When we told Ace that story, he was convinced that they were skimming off money and putting it into a Swiss bank account. Sure enough, we played Zurich and on a day off, Doc and Paco had to go attend to some business. We even told Jean and Paul about our suspicions, but they just chalked it up to Ace's paranoid conspiracy theories. What else did I expect to hear from them? I wanted the reunion to make up for certain things. I thought that maybe Jean and Paul had a point, maybe they weren't as crazy as I thought they were. Well, they were even crazier when we all got back together. I thought some of that. Old camaraderie would resurface, but in the end it was all about the M, O, N, E, Y. And here I was, trying to make amends for fucking up on stage in a show in 1978. So it was disheartening when I realized that they were taking so much from the party, and I was working so hard for so little. I had been a co- CEO of General Motors and now I was cleaning the latrines at a plant in Detroit. It was so irritating to hear Jean say, you're working for me and you'll do what I say or you'll be fired just like any other employee. I wanted to cut his throat from ear to ear. If he had said that to me back in the day, I would have taken a bottle and smashed it right across his forehead. But I had changed, even if they hadn't. They were making more money than they'd ever make again in their lives because of Ace and me, the two fucking lunatics. Without us, KISS would have been a boring band. But now we were the second, class citizens of the group. Anything that went wrong, we got the blame for. And if I'd object to any of these inequities, I'd be labeled a complainer. So I made a strategic withdrawal. I had millions at one point of my life, and it was all gone. So I realized that I had to stick it out for however long we were doing this and make enough money so I wouldn't have to work again. Take it in the ass as long as you can take it, put up with their shit, bite the bullet and just do it, be a man and get that fucking cash and then say, good, bye, I don't fucking need you. Take this job and shove it. Music had never been about the money to me but now, at 50, I'd been to hell and back and I needed it. I decided not to be part of the boys club anymore. Doc and Paco were upset that they couldn't drag me into their fold, smoking cigars and drinking. I knew that if I went down to the bar, I wouldn't be able to say no. I'd have a scotch, it tastes good. I'd see some tits and ass, and they would look better. Doc would buy me another round and everything would look even better yet. And then I'd take someone up to my room and fuck up. And I'd feel and play like shit the next day. That wasn't going to happen. Who wanted to hang with them anyway? When we finished playing each night, they'd invite me to dinner, but I didn't even want to sit at the same table with those guys. They weren't my people anymore. You had one pompous asshole in Jean, a supreme egotist who would drool over every woman in the restaurant. If the waitress was attractive, he would take her hand and lick it and try to give her his room number. It was so embarrassing. He'd be wearing this stupid kiss baseball cap to cover his balding, weaved hair. He used to have this weave that looked like a Davy Crockett hat. It looked like birds were living on his head. And his stupid cap would sit on top of it because it couldn't fit over that plugged, up monstrosity. Every night he wore the same blue work shirt that said kiss on it, so he stunk to high hell. He still wouldn't shower with us. He'd just take a wet rag and wipe off all the blood he spat during the show, down his chest, on his dick. 
he'd wipe it off, throw the rag in the corner, and then he'd take a towel so you wouldn't see him naked, slip his underwear on underneath, and then drop the towel. There would still be nasty blood dripping down his legs, nasty spit, his hair had all this stuff in it. He'd just take another towel, wipe it, and put on his blue work shirt and those cheap vinyl pants that were supposed to look like leather. And this prick thought he was handsome. He'd call the waiter over to the table. Mr. Simmons, what's wrong? This is chicken. Yes, sir. It looks like the dead carcass of a pig's asshole, you jerk. Go get me something that looks like food, not roadkill. As the waiter walked away he'd say, waiters. No money, no brains. Morons. Why didn't I want to eat with them? Then I'd have the Machiavellian star child at the table. Polly had to have everything perfect. This food is horrible. This isn't the way it should be made. So the waiter would say, well, how would you like it, Mr. Stanley? And he would say, I have to tell you how to cook. Ace would be slobbering over his food and Doc McGee would be laughing, drinking, let me tell you another story about Michael Jackson. I was in his room once. Blah, blah, blah. It was a circus. I just couldn't sit at this table of fools. As much as they accused me of being a degenerate drug, addict maniac, I had more class in my pinky than those animals will ever have with all their money. They would sit there, Doc and Jean and Paul, and they would talk over important band business as if Ace and I didn't even exist. Doc would joke, so on the Super Bowl show, I have an idea. We get 50, 6 naked chicks running around and if we chimed in with our opinion, they'd be like, what did you say? I'm in the band, no. No, you're Ace and Peter. We're Kiss. We make the decisions, you guys just play in the band. They'd say that stuff at the dinner table with the local promoters there and their guests like I needed to be put in my place in front of strangers. Jean and Paul would always act superior, make you feel like you were beneath them. You had to constantly be on your best behavior, you couldn't loosen up and be yourself or laugh and have a good time without thinking that they were going to make fun of you or stare weirdly at you. They would just feed on every weakness you had. If you pronounced a word incorrectly, they'd jump on you and correct it in such a condescending way in front of everybody. Ace wasn't like that. He was so dysfunctional himself that he certainly couldn't throw the first stone. Ace wasn't evil, I thought. I brought Gigi to dinner with them once and she never wanted to go again. She was kicking me under the table, whispering, now I know. Why you don't want to go out with them, they're insane. So we would just go back to the room after the show. That was what that song on my last album doesn't get better than this was about. We'd lock that hotel, room door and Gigi would call up room service. We'd eat something good order up a movie, make love, go to sleep. So who wanted to go down and have dinner with the fools?